in your cell. <laughs> the CCJS website doesn't have a bit of biographical information about him. I, I know he, he is on the faculty because I know I've seen his office. <laughs> <laughs> but if he wants to, he'll tell you about his biography. He is an esteemed colleague, and year after year that he's done this lecture, uh, the students have come back and said, that was one of the most interesting lectures that I saw this semester. <coughs> so I hope I'm not putting the on him uh, for that. He has uh, a book, and it's got a very catchy title, Big House in, in, a, small town. in a Small Town. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, based on his work, which is on prison and their effects on the communities in which they're placed. So put your hands together for one of the most amazing <laughs> I think the other problem is if you try to Google Eric Williams, you're going to get about 50,000 different hits, so that's not going to help you at all. I will tell you one piece of my background, because I'm finally excited to like, to like say this publicly. So, so I, I, I moved out, well, uh, so I, I moved out to California, uh, I guess three, almost four years ago now. And, uh, you know, back, I, I grew up back east and, and people would be like, where'd you go to college? And I'd say Lehigh. And no one had ever heard of Lehigh. Everyone was like, where, huh, what? Well, anyone who's a college basketball fan might know that on Friday night, my Lehigh University Mountain Hawks took Duke University's, whatever the hell they are, out of the NCAA tournament. So now I'm hoping that when I say I went to Lehigh, people may not know where it is, but they may know that we beat Duke. That's all I care about. So, uh, so that's a little bit, bit of my background. Um, I, I really am honored to be here. I, you know, the, I, my first year here, uh, uh, Myrna asked me to do this, and, and I, I didn't know that much about the Holocaust Lecture Series. Uh, you know, I, I figured they'd just bring in, you know, a bunch of people from Sonoma State to, to give talks. And every year I look at the list of the people that you're bringing in, and, and it just honors me that, that you keep bringing me back. Um, on the downside of it, you know, I, I don't know if you guys noticed there's a camera up here, so you can watch this up on YouTube. Uh, so sometime the next week that will get posted to YouTube. Uh, a day or two after that, my older brother Danny will watch it. <laughs> and then he'll give me notes. <laughs> and I'll either get an email or a phone call. And he has things he likes to point out, like, I, I guess I do this thing where I rub my head. <laughs> and he's like, dude, you're bald. Like, <laughs> you got to make it shiny for everybody? Like, what, what's that all about? Uh, you know, it, so, so that's the downside of doing this every year is that, that, uh, that, that phone call will come in about a week and a half. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, so I'm, I'm here to talk about uh, the Nuremberg trials uh, and, uh, and some of what, what came afterwards, uh, international war crimes generally. And, uh, and just to sort of give you my background and interest in this, is I'm not a Holocaust studies person at all. Uh, what I am is a, sort of a, a Jewish kid who's a nerd. And, um, and when, I was, when I was young, when I was nine years old, I, uh, I, I got to see Elie Wiesel, the author of Don, came to my hometown and spoke. And I grew up in the middle, I grew up in Bangor, Maine. It's, it's nothing. So the fact that he was coming to our town was huge. And, and, and after he came, I was so moved that, that I started reading a lot of things about the Holocaust. And I, I think probably a lot of Jewish kids do this. You know? and, and you start thinking about you know, your own life and, and perhaps how lucky you are. And I was a pretty religious Jewish kid as well. And, um, and as I got older, you know, it was, uh, I took a class on the Holocaust, similar to this actually, uh, in undergrad at Lehigh, Beaters of Duke. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to get that in there as much as possible. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but moved away from it as I, I went to graduate school, I got interested in the law. I teach the law classes here, I'm the pre law advisor. Uh, I started doing work on prisons. I actually, when people ask me why I got interested in prisons, I trace it back to my interest in the Holocaust, as strange as that might sound. Uh, but when I was in graduate school, I read, uh, there's a former Harvard law professor, he's passed away, but uh, his name was Lon Fuller. And uh, he was a guy who wrote about, about legal theory. 
And, and he used to write these really interesting hypotheticals. And I have my students read some of them and write papers on them from time to time. And, and one of them he wrote is, uh, is, is about, it's called the purple shirt regime and the problem of the grudge informer. So you guys did that earlier this semester. And, and what he tries to imagine is, is how you deal with prosecuting people who do evil things, despite the fact that in some ways what they did was perfectly legal. And, and what he was thinking about at the time was they were talking about what to do with these war criminals, what to do with the Nazi leadership especially, when technically they didn't do anything illegal. You know, what do you do with, you know, let's, we'll put it in an American context. Um, you guys may, may have heard last week uh, an American soldier went a little crazy and he killed 15 civilians in Afghanistan, all right? So it's fairly obvious what you do with that soldier, right? You put him on trial or you find out if, it, if he's insane, you, you figure out a way to deal with him. There are laws on the books to deal with somebody <coughs> who mows down 15 civilians. But what do you do with the person who put him in the situation that made him do that? Do you put George W. Bush on trial for starting an aggressive war? Can you do that? I don't know. And so the question becomes for Lon Fuller, what do you do with these Nazi leaders? How do you put a state on trial? How do you put the German government on trial? How do you put the person who signed the form that led to somebody doing this, to doing this, to doing this, that led to somebody dying? How do you put that person on trial when they didn't do anything that was technically illegal? And so this really got my interest in, in, in the Nuremberg trials, because that's really what they had to work out. So um, just to give you an overview of, of what we're going to talk about today. I, I don't use PowerPoint a lot, so I apologize. I, I always criticize my freshmen when they look back at their PowerPoints during presentations, and now I'm going to do the same. Um, so, and I have my notes in front of me, which makes it that more, much more pathetic. Uh, so, basically what we're going to do is we're going to go through uh, the Nuremberg trials. There were actually 13 trials, and I'll get to that in a second. We're going to focus the main part of our discussion on the main Nuremberg trial. This was the big Nuremberg trial for the major Nazi war criminals. The, the 24, well, 22 of them that actually were in the dock. And we're going to go through and talk about that Nuremberg main trial, how it came to be, what happened in that trial. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the subsequent trials, the 12 trials that took place afterwards uh, for the Einstock Gruppen, for the Nazi doctors, for the Nazi lawyers. Because I think in some ways those trials, those subsequent trials, were what ended up leading us. They became the precedents that we now use to put war criminals on trial. Um, we're then going to talk a little bit about Bosnia and Rwanda, uh, the genocides there and the war crimes tribunals that came out of there. They dealt with them in very different ways. I think the Rwandan way is a very interesting one. Um, and then the eventual creation of the International Criminal Court. The International Criminal Court in July celebrates its 10th anniversary of existence, which is, uh, which is both an exciting and not so exciting moment when you hear about how well or not well the court has done over time. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the lessons of the Nuremberg trials and, and, and the cases that came afterwards. <clears throat> All right, so the Nuremberg trials were, the International Military Tribunal of, of 1946 was, was convened by the victors in World War II. The French are counted as victors. I don't know, I count them as victors, but they were part of, the, they were part of it. Uh, the Russians, the British, and the United States were really the biggest push behind this, this big trial. Um, and then the 12 cases that came afterwards, which were US military tribunals. They were internationally run, but they were specific US military tribunals to deal with the doctors, the lawyers, and the industrialists. OK, so let's, let's go through a little bit of, of the timeline. Um, in, there were a series of meetings, probably the most important one for our purposes was, was the uh, Yalta Agreement, which was signed, obviously, in Yalta, uh, which, which took place uh, the week of February the 4th to the 11th, 1945. We hadn't won the war yet, but it had become <coughs> obvious that we were going to. And so Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin uh, got together in Yalta to try to 
hash out how they were going to deal with Germany afterwards. So it wasn't specifically to talk about the war crimes trials, but they wanted to figure out what they were going to do with Germany. And at this conference, they started this discussion about, well, what are we going to do with the Germans? What are we going to do with the Nazis? What are we going to do with the SS officers? What are we going to do with the people who ran this show? And what they realized was that they had three very different views on exactly what should go on. Churchill was the one who was sort of the loudest and most boisterous about, about what he thought should happen. What he wanted was what he called courts of inquiry. And a court of inquiry's job is only to decide if you have the person you think you have. And what, what, uh, what Churchill wanted to do was go around uh, Germany, pick up Nazi leaders, figure out who they were. OK, you're Eichmann, who, who did escape. But OK, you're Eichmann. We've got your ID. We've got a positive ID. And now we're going to shoot you in the head. And Churchill, this is called drumhead justice. And it's always been sort of one of the ways that victors deal with these problems. Let's just take the 2,500 biggest leaders and blow their brains out. And maybe we'll figure out a way to deal with the SS officers, or maybe we'll let Germany deal with them themselves, but, but this is what we're going to do. And Churchill was, was dead serious. He wanted to do it on the spot. He wanted it done by the end of 1945, and he wanted to walk away from it. Stalin, it, it's a little hard to figure out exactly what Stalin wanted. Uh, what we do know Stalin said, unfortunately, it was in the context of a cocktail party in Yalta, and Stalin liked to drink a lot. Uh, Stalin was also loud. And Stalin said, you know, you Westerners, you just don't know how to deal with this stuff. I figured out a way to deal with political dissidents, and this is the way we should deal with, with the Nazis. Let's round up, I don't know, 50 to 100,000 of them. We'll have these things called show trials. We won't allow them to defend themselves. They'll have had a trial. Once the trial is done, we'll shoot them in the head. <laughs> it's a common theme, if you're noticing. <laughs> and this is what he really wanted to do. It's what he did with his own political dissidents. He, he, he'd take them into court. There'd be, you know, 1,000 of them. There'd be a judge there. The prosecutor would read off the charges. The judge would find them guilty. The defendants weren't allowed to speak. You throw them in prison for a couple days, and then you shoot. And he thought this was, this was really the best way to do it. Well, Roosevelt didn't like that so much. <laughs> Roosevelt being a liberal, him ha he having a, a vision of a rule of law, uh, he wasn't so sure. And so he actually asked his advisors for help. And so I'll, I'll tell you what some of his advisors said in a second. I think in some ways, um, Dachau being liberated by the US uh, put a mark on the seriousness of needing to do something. The US knew about Auschwitz. The US knew that the Germans were killing Jews in mass numbers. Knowing what they were doing and seeing what they were doing was, were very different things. When all of a sudden you had US soldiers walking into a concentration camp, seeing dead bodies, seeing these skeletal people, seeing the gas chambers, now all of a sudden the US says, yeah, we really have to do something. This is a horror the likes of which we've never seen. It's so systematic, we have to do something. Okay? At the end of April, Hitler commits suicide. And right after Hitler's suicide, on, on, on May 2nd, Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson is appointed chief prosecutor. This is also a really important moment because it shows how serious the U.S. is. This is a Supreme Court justice, and he's going to take time off from his job to go and be the prosecutor. This is an amazing thing. I can't even imagine somebody doing this today. Robert Jackson signing on to be the chief prosecutor. He had been the former attorney general of the United States under FDR. He was a well-known Supreme Court justice. Some people thought he was going to be the next chief justice. He kind of got screwed out of the deal, but that's not worth going into here. Um, Truman ended up appointing his poker buddy to be uh, chief justice instead of Jackson. Uh, but Jackson was a, was, was a huge figure in American law. And so everybody knew when Jackson was appointed that the, the Americans were going to take this seriously. The other thing that became obvious was that this was going to be a legal production. 
This is a Supreme Court justice. He is not going to allow drumhead justice to take place. He's not going to allow show trials. And so Jackson really pushes the American plan through. Now, to say there was an American plan, there ended up being one American plan, but there were actually a, a couple of different ones, and, I, and I'll put them in two categories. Uh, one, is, one is the Morgenthau plan. And Morgenthau was the Secretary of the Treasury. He was also Jewish. Uh, when he heard what was going on in Germany, he, he wanted justice. And he basically agreed with Churchill, except he wanted to go a little bit further. He wanted the summary execution of the 2,500 or so top Nazi leaders that you could find. He then wanted to take all of the members of the SS and SA that could be found, and he wanted them put into concentration camps. For life. He wanted them to be slave labor to see what, was, what they had been doing to other people. In the meantime, he wanted all of the industrialized parts of Germany to be leveled, those that weren't already leveled by the bombing. He wanted to make sure that Germany never became a power again. And so they would become basically an agrarian culture. They would be, they'd be growing grapes, which they did. But uh, they still do that today. But he basically wanted them to become deindustrialized. And you've got to realize, I mean, you know, this is 30 years after World War I that World War II took place. You know, dearming the, the Versailles Treaty and making sure that the Germans couldn't militarize again didn't work so well the first time. And so the fear that the Germans might do this again wasn't out of the question. And so for Morgenthau, making them an agrarian nation was the way to make sure that they couldn't do it again. And to make sure that you came down hard on them was the way to make sure they didn't do it again. Well, again, FDR is kind of a liberal. Uh, you know, both in a, in a sense of a classical liberal, but also, you know, he's probably the father of modern liberalism, at least as a president. And, and he wanted something that was a little more legalistic. And so he had Henry Stimson, his Secretary of War said, no, 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 that's too much. We shouldn't do that. We need some sort of legal action taken, not for the crimes against humanity. You have to realize throughout this, the crimes against humanity in some ways were secondary. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. He said what we need to punish the Germans for is this waging of aggressive war. We need to stop other countries from waging aggressive wars. Well, how do you do that? Well, you have a trial for waging an aggressive war, and you find him guilty, and you do whatever you do. And that sounds very simple, but there are two really big problems that Stimson was up against. First is, is what's called ex post, is that the laws would be ex post facto. And the second problem was dealing with the state as an entity. And so I'll explain both of them right now. Uh, do most of you, have you heard of the concept of ex post facto? I could call on my con law students and see if they know where it is in the Constitution. The notion of an ex post facto law is that the government cannot make something illegal today and prosecute you for doing it yesterday. If it was legal yesterday, it was legal. You can stop somebody doing it from here forward, but you can't go backwards. It can't be retroactive. So, uh, for example, um, I don't, I don't know that much about this. It, it turns out like uh, in New Jersey where I went to graduate school, it, it, somebody got, it, it turns out you can get high off certain bath soaps. Did you guys know this? Yeah. It's kind of frightening, isn't it? Like bath soap. So they were selling these bath soaps in head shops in New Jersey. Um, and, uh, and you can get high off them. Well, they weren't illegal. So these stores could sell them perfectly legally because the chemical compounds in them were legal. And so New Jersey had to go and pass a law after some guy took the bath salts, went crazy, killed his wife or girlfriend or something like that. Um, it's a frightening world I live in studying criminal justice, I have to say. Um, and, and, and so they had to go back and, and make these bath salts illegal. Well, what do you do with the dude who was taking the bath salts and went crazy and killed his wife? What do you do with the guy who sold him the bath salts? You don't do anything. There's nothing you can do. Because it's an ex post facto law. You cannot retroactively go after this person. So how is it that you make it illegal to wage a, a, an aggressive war when there's no such thing as international law at this point in time? There really isn't anything in 1945 that's really international law. There's some civil laws. 
that you can, you know, there's marine laws that are international, but there's no international criminal law in 1945. So how do you punish the Germans for waging an aggressive war? That's a problem. And that's, it's, it's still a problem as far as I'm concerned with Nuremberg. They never really got over it. They just kind of ignored it. The second problem is how do you deal again with these state actors, right? How do you deal with the person who signed the piece of paper that led to this, that led to this, that led to this? You know, it's easy to go after the SS guard who shoots somebody in the head. Not necessarily easy, you gotta find him, you gotta put him on trial, you gotta find witnesses, but you know what he did. He committed murder, that's easy. What do you do with the guy that made sure the trains to Auschwitz ran on time? What do you do with the guy who punched numbers into a calculator? They had calculators in 1945, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. Abacus. Who <laughs> messed around with the abacus to make sure that Auschwitz had enough slaves? What do you do with that guy? Did he pull a trigger? No. Was he involved in, in the killing of Jews? Absolutely. But did he pull the trigger? No. So how do you deal with this? So Stimson gets this guy, Murray Bernays, who's a, a brilliant Columbia law grad, and says, make me a legal argument. Figure out how I do this. How do I figure this out? How do I make this legal? And Bernays comes up with this idea that the Nazis, rather than being a government, a legal government, the Nazis are a criminal conspiracy aimed at killing people, and waging aggressive wars. That they are a massive criminal conspiracy. They're like the mafia, <coughs> right? So this is, this is what we do in this country. We have what are called RICO laws. You know, John Gotti, uh, you guys still know who John Gotti is or am I dating my, you guys know who John Gotti is? Yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah. Sad. His daughter's on bad TV shows. Uh, <laughs> he, was, he was the head of the Gambino crime family. He died in prison a couple of years ago. John Gotti was, was the head of, head of a mafia organization. He didn't pull the trigger. He didn't beat the crap out of people to get money from them. He told somebody to tell somebody to tell somebody to do it. So how do you get him? Well, you say he's, he's part of a massive criminal conspiracy, and that's how we'll get him. And so this is what Bernays came up with. And at this point, FDR had, had passed away, but FDR was leaning towards the Stimson plan, and Truman really liked this plan. This was a brilliant plan. It was a way to not have victor's justice, where you just put people's head on, a, on, a, you know, on the ground and shoot them. You actually have a legal trial, and you set a precedent that allows for future legal trials. OK. Moving right. So in, in May, um, Germany surrenders unconditionally. In, uh, in August. I had to do that in my head, that 8, eight means August. Uh, in August of 1945, we have the London Agreement. And, and the London Agreement essentially is the agreement that they come to as to how these trials are gonna work. And the problem with how these trials are gonna work is they didn't want it to just be a United States show. In some ways, they didn't want it just to be the United States and the UK. They wanted all of the victors, and we'll count France as a victor. Uh, sorry, is that sarcasm coming out of me? Um, <laughs> we'll count France as a victor for, the, for our purposes, and Russia. How do you deal with these four different countries with four different types of law, and how do you get them together and, and come together and have this big trial? And so what they came up with was this, this sort of quasi-continental, quasi-common law system. So something like what happened in France, something like what they claimed happened in Russia, and something also like what they had in the US and the UK. But the fact is, is that this is Jackson's show. And it's Jackson's show for two reasons. One, he's a Supreme Court justice, and that's just cool. So he's got some pull. The other thing is, is that the United States, we have the best Nazis, and we have the most documents. <coughs> And so this allows Jackson to sort of push things the way he wanted them to go. And so the Bernays plan with this criminal conspiracy is, is what we end up with. So the mix of the adversarial and the continental system essentially works like this. You guys know what an adversarial system looks like? All of you guys have watched Law and Order once in your life, right? You got the prosecutor up there in the defense and they yell at each other and scream and you, you have a jury figure it out. Okay. So we have the adversarial system where you have the judge and you have the defense and you have the prosecution. 
right? So you have the prosecution led by Jackson, you have the defense lawyers on the other side, but instead of having a jury like we would in the United States, we took a continental system where the judges actually made the decisions and the judges were allowed to ask questions. So it's this sort of weird hybrid system that they come up with. On October 18, 1945, 24 men and seven organizations are indicted as criminal, con these are criminal conspiracy organizations. Those organizations are important because they become the organizations that the future Nuremberg trials were used. So the Einstein Gruppen was, was indicted and convicted and they, so anyone who was a member of that criminal conspiracy could be tried. Um, they indicted 24 men, uh, 22 actually went on trial. Martin Borman was tried in, absent in absentia, which means he wasn't there. We thought Martin Borman was alive. There were like Ma Martin Borman sightings everywhere. Like, oh, I saw him. I think he's in, a, you know, he's in Argentina, whatever. Turns out he was dead. They found his body in 1972. Um, but Borman was tried and found guilty in absentia. And, and the 24th person, a guy named Robert Lay, actually committed suicide before we had a chance to put him on trial. Um, and, and so we have now these indictments in, uh, in November, Nuremberg trials begin, and all the defendants plead not guilty. All right, so what are the charges? Just making sure it's safe. Um, so what are the charges? Basically, there are, three, there are four charges, but we'll put them in three groupings. The first charge is, is crimes against peace. That's the war of aggression. The crime against peace was actually, in some ways, the most legally sound of all of the charges, because what you could prove was that Germany had violated treaties, and they had violated a lot of them. The Treaty of Versailles said they wouldn't rearm, they did. You know, they had treaties saying they wouldn't go into Poland, they did. So they violated these treaties. The problem why it's, I say it's on the best legal ground, the problem with it is that treaties have never been enforceable through criminal law. And now we were enforcing it through criminal law. But putting that aside. The second uh, set of charges were war crimes. And war crimes have to do with, our, with the German treatment of POWs. The Germans actually treated American and British POWs pretty well. They did not treat Russian POWs well at all. And so for their treatment, especially of the Russian POWs, they were going to be put on trial. The third, and it is the third, as much as we think of Nuremberg as being about the crimes against humanity, it was not the foremost in Jackson's mind. The third is crimes against humanity. That's the genocide. That's the treatment of the Jews. The, what's the term for gypsies that you said that's more politically correct? Roma? Sorry, I call them gypsies. Uh, it's, it's for those things that they did. What we normally think of as then what they were put on trial for. Um, okay. They also had to have a discussion about what kinds of defense you were going to allow the war criminals. And there were a couple of problems. The, the first one is, is who do you allow them to pick as attorneys? They didn't want this to be about victor's justice, so they didn't want to like, have to force attorneys on them. So what happens when you allow the Nazis to pick their own attorneys? Well, who are they going to pick? Other Nazis. Other Nazis. OK? And there's two reasons for this. One is that those are the people they know best. And the other reason is that anyone who practiced law who wasn't a Nazi either wasn't in Germany anymore or wasn't alive anymore. <laughs> Right? So this is who they're going to have to pick from. And so they made a decision in London that, OK, we'll let them choose Nazis. And about half of the defendants had, had former Nazis to, to represent them. <clears throat> they also said there are two defenses that are normally used in a common law system that we're not going to allow them to use. One is called tu quoque. My Latin is awful, so that's the best you're going to get. Um, basically, what tu quoque means is that it's a defense saying, you did it too. What Jackson did not want was the Nazis to get up there and say, yeah, we were bad. Yeah, we put people in concentration camps. What did you guys do in California with your Japanese rest restaurants? Uh, your Japanese residents, I think. Your Japanese residents. What did you do? You put them in concentration camps. Okay, you didn't mow them down the way we did, but you still did that. 
Did you treat all of your POWs well? My students just read a case where there were some people who were de decided by the Supreme Court that they were unlawful enemy combatants who we executed with military tribunals. We didn't give them full trials. So the United States was executing German spies, but they executed them. They didn't hold them as POWs. So they decided you can't use that defense. You can't point your finger at us and say, you did it too, which is normally allowed as a defense. If you were bad and I was bad, then it all evens out, or at least it makes, mitigates what it is that I did. The other thing that, that they wouldn't allow them is that it's a common law defense, what's called duress. I was acting under duress. I was just following orders. I'm a colonel. I'm the commandant of, of Auschwitz. I'm, I'm responsible for the murder of two and a half million people and the death by disease and starvation of another half a million people. What am I going to say in defense of doing that? I was following orders, and if I didn't do it, I would have been sucking the gas myself. I would have died too. That's duress. And in some ways, that's, that's a defense. It's, it's not quite self-defense, but it's certainly mitigated. And so they said, you know what? They can claim they were just following orders, but we're not going to take it that seriously, because several people did actually argue that exactly. So in some ways, <coughs> Even though this wasn't exactly Victor's justice, in some ways it was a little bit, because we cut off, really, the only defenses the Nazis had against their actions. All right, so let's talk about the players a little bit, and then I'll get to the trial itself. The chief judge was Lord Geoffrey Lawrence. Uh, he was, obviously, uh, British, if you couldn't figure that out by his name, Lord Lawrence. Uh, he was uh, a fairly undistinguished British judge, which was interesting that he was named chief judge. Francis Biddle, who was the chief United States judge, thought he was going to be the chief judge. And first off, Jackson didn't like Biddle very much. Uh, and second off, uh, we didn't want it to just be the US show. And so we thought, all right, we'll let the UK have the chief judgeship. And so Jeffrey Lawrence was made chief judge. As it turns out, even though he wasn't that well respected before this started, he was fantastic. He was a fabulous judge. He made quick rulings. He was decisive. And in some ways, what he made sure to do was to allow the trial to be as fair as possible. In some ways, Jackson got really upset with him because he said he let Goering and some of the other Nazis go on way too long in their defense of what it was that what they did. But he wanted to have a fair trial as much as possible. The other judges, Francis Biddle, who I just mentioned, uh, Francis Biddle had been attorney general after Justice Jackson under FDR. Um, I, you know, he was bitter from the time he wasn't named chief judge, and, it, and he never did anything of importance ever again. I think he was bitter for the rest of his life. Just thought I'd tell you that. Uh, the, uh, the Russian judge, who did do something interesting uh, afterwards, was Major General I'm not, Nikichenko. I'm, that's the best I'm going to do. Uh, Nikichenko is important for two reasons. The first one is that, that they claimed that, that during the trial, he was consistently on the phone with Stalin trying to figure out how he should rule. So really, he didn't have a whole lot of independence. And as it turns out, he dissented from a lot of the, the rulings because he felt that they went too easy. There were a few people who were acquitted. Some people got life in prison. Stalin didn't like that. Um, and so Nikichenko uh, ended up, uh, ended up, uh, ended up uh, disagreeing with parts of the verdict. Uh, he and, and actually the, uh, he, he ends up showing up again. Um, you guys probably don't remember this, but uh, there, was a, there was a spy plane that was shot down over Russia in the 50s. I don't remember what year, 52? I, I don't know. Uh, Gary Powers is the guy who was flying the spy plane. And, uh, and he ended up being put on trial for being a spy in Russia. <laughs> and, and Nikichenko actually was the guy who prosecuted him. So he did something somewhat famous afterwards. Um, and the French judge, I'm not going to try to pronounce his name, and he really doesn't do anything. All right. The prosecutors. As I said, Robert Jackson, Justice Robert Jackson, was the chief prosecutor. Jackson, um, Jackson ran, the, this was Jackson's show. Jackson hired 700, uh, sorry, 600 lawyers to put 23 people on trial. 600 lawyers. Uh, this was a Big deal. But there was a, there was a ton of documents, uh, so, and we'll get to that in a second. But Jackson, this was really his show. Um, as it turns out, we'll talk about Jackson a little bit. Jackson, um, J 
Jackson had been a, a judge for a little too long and turned out not to be not to be great in the courtroom. Uh, he was really good in terms of his opening argument. He was, he was really good in terms of his understanding of documents. He wasn't very good at cross-examining witnesses. And fairly early on, they realized that uh, Sir Hartley Shawcross from the UK was much, much better at it. And so Shawcross ended up, after Goering, doing the cross-examination of most of the, the war criminals who were on trial. Um, Rodenko and, and Menthon were uh, also not that important. Okay, so these are the defendants sitting in the dock uh, awaiting trial. You see their little headphones on. Uh, we'll talk about them. I, I put them in categories. In some ways, um, we did end up catching some big people. Goering, biggest among them. Who we didn't end up catching were the ones we really wanted the most. First is Hitler. Hitler was dead. Uh, we really wanted to catch Himmler. Himmler was dead. We really wanted to catch Goebbels. Goebbels was dead. We really wanted to catch Eichmann. Eichmann, we thought was dead. It turns out he was in Argentina. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So we didn't get the four people we really, really wanted. The people we got were, were Goering, who was important, certainly. Um, and then we got underlings of the people we really wanted. And so they sort of represented categories for us. They were sort of standings. And so I would, I would argue that, that in some ways, Goering and, and, and Hess were the stand-ins for Hitler. They were the, the highest ranking Nazi leaders we got. Uh, Goering was important. Goering was Hitler's second in command. Hitler said that, that Goering would take over for him after he died, which I don't think Hitler thought was ever going to happen. We also knew who Goering was. Like, Americans kind of knew who Goering was because he was, um, I don't know any other way to put this, he was kind of the clown prince of, of Germany. Uh, he, behind his back, uh, always behind his back, uh, he was referred to as Fatso. He was about 5'8", 300 pounds. Uh, he wore these just garish, outlandish uniforms, like powder blue uniforms with all of these like various big things coming off of it. Um, he used to change clothes like five times a day. I don't know if he just was sweating a lot or if he just thought it was interesting. Um, you know, they have a, there's a great documentary that came out on PBS a few years ago, and they have a picture of Goering at his estate petting this baby tiger to his pet. <laughs> you know, this was Goering. I mean, he, was the, he really was the clown prince. But he was, he was the second in command. Um, he was the guy who read the Nuremberg laws. He was very, very important. He was also severely addicted to morphine. Severely. Uh, when they caught him, he, turned, he actually turned himself over. Um, and he had about 80 pieces of luggage with him because he had to hold his uniform somewhere. <laughs> One of the pieces of luggage was filled with 20,000 morphine pills. 20,000 morphine pills. I don't even think Rush Limbaugh had that many when he got caught. I think he had like 10,000 or something like that. 20,000 morphine pills. He was like, he figured he could stay high for the whole trial. I mean, like, he was like, oh, they'll let me take them. And then they took away his morphine. Um, and they put him on a diet. And, uh, and, and he lost about 80 pounds before the trial. And in some ways, it almost would have been better if they had left him high. Because what they didn't realize about Goering, like they thought he was this clown prince, and they didn't realize that when he sobered up, he was smart. I mean, he was devastatingly bright, and he was devastatingly unapologetic. And he ended up being Jackson's worst nightmare in the courtroom in some ways. Uh, the other high party leader they found was, was Rudolf Hess. And, and Rudolf Hess is, um, yeah, he's, uh, he's interesting. Uh, so let's tell you the Hess story. The thing is that with Hess is that he sat most of the war out. Uh, in 1941, Rudolf Hess stole a plane. We don't know if he stole a plane or if he borrowed it or if it was given to him, but he flew to Scotland and he tried to find a guy named Lord Hamilton who he had, uh, he had been introduced to once at a party and he was going to make peace. He was like, they're Aryans, we're Aryans, we should all get along, I'm going to settle this thing. And so then he gets caught and Hitler, he's Hitler's third in, in command at this point in time and Hitler doesn't know what to do with it. So Hitler goes, you know what, Hess is crazy. 
Well, Hess is a good Nazi. So what do you do when Hitler calls you crazy? You say, I'm crazy. He said, I'm crazy. I have amnesia. I don't remember flying anywhere. I don't remember anyone. I don't remember anything. And so he spent the entire war in a prisoner of war camp uh, in England. And then we shipped him back to Nuremberg. And he kept saying, I'm crazy, I'm crazy, I'm crazy. And I'll get to just how uncrazy he was in a second. All right. Um, the propagandists. These were really the stand-ins for Goebbels. These were guys who were at least a part of the machine uh, that, that made the Nazis as popular as they were. They were not Goebbels, but they were the best we could do. Uh, Julius Stryker was, by all accounts, just a despicable idiot and kind of a scumbag. I mean, you could call all of them scumbags in their way, but Stryker like, was worse, even. Uh, he, he published a paper called Der Sturmer, which was just a Jew-baiting, uh, awful rag. Uh, Stryker made the mistake once. He, uh, he, 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 got, uh, he got dissed at a party by Goering, and he got mad at Goering, so he published in his paper on the front page that Goering was impotent and that Goering's <laughs> child wasn't really his child, which is not a smart move. <laughs> Goering's number two in the party. He may have been the clown prince, but he also has a bit of a temper. And so Stryker ended up spending some time in a concentration camp himself. Uh, he ends up getting kicked out of the Nazi party, but we caught him and we put him on trial because he was the best we could do. Um, Alfred Rosenberg was, was sort of considered the chief Nazi philosopher. He was the one who, who took, uh, took Hitler's ideas and tried to give them some philosophical grounding using Hegel and Kant and other people none of you have ever heard of. OK. Some of you have, maybe? Hegel and Kant. Ah, excellent. All right. Um, all right, the henchmen. These are the stand-ins for Himmler. Himmler, again, was dead. Himmler was the head of the SS. Um, Hans Frank was, uh, was the governor general of Nazi-occupied Poland. He was, personally, I would say, personally responsible for the death of two million Jews. He was called the Jew Butcher of Krakow. Uh, and, and so he was sort of the stand-in for the SS. The other stand-in for Himmler that we got was Ernst Kaltenbrunner. And the media loved Kaltenbrunner. I can't ever say his name. I'll call him Ernst. They loved him because he looked like what a Nazi should look like. <laughs> right, doesn't he? Yeah. And he had this, you can't, you can kind of see it a little bit. He had this huge purple scar across his face. And he liked to tell people he'd gotten in, in a fight when he was in the army. Well, one, when he was being interrogated, uh, there's a great book written by one of, the one of the translators. And when he was being interrogated, they asked him how he really got the scar. It turns out he had, a, he had a bit of a drinking problem. And he was drunk driving one night. And he hit a tree, and he went through the windshield. And that's how he cut himself. But he liked to tell everyone it was from a fight. And so they kind of really, the, the press really liked him. He was like six foot three, and he was like, looked like a, the evil Nazi. And he was. He was Himmler's second, he was Himmler's second in command. But he was also kind of a buffoon. Uh, the military commanders, we actually did end up getting the top German military commanders. Um, Jodl and Keitel uh, were really number one and number two in the German army. And the reason we caught them is because they turned themselves over to us, that it was the honorable thing to do. We also uh, had on trial Admiral Donitz, who, uh, who, was, who actually did take power after Hitler killed himself. And he ended up signing the unconditional surrender. So we really did have the, the chief military commanders. Uh, the slave drivers, these were the stand-ins for Eichmann. Because Eichmann was on his way to Argentina at this point in time. Um, and, but we did catch Albert Speer, who was the Reich Minister of Armaments and Munitions, and uh, Fritz Sauckel, who was the Chief of Slave, slave Labor Recruitment. Now, Speer's title, which says, oh, Reich Minister of Armaments and Munitions, it just sounds like he's the dude who counts that they had enough guns. Actually, he's the dude who tells Salcal, this is how many slaves I need to make sure to make enough guns. Okay? And Speer, I've heard it argued that Speer actually did have the highest IQ of any of the people who were on trial uh, at Nuremberg. And, uh, and he, ended up, uh, he ended up getting a fairly light sentence. And, and, uh, and I'll tell you about him. Uh, the other people we really wanted to get were the industrialists, the people who actually were using the slave labor to their advantage. 
Um, shocked, the, the Reich Bank president always argued that he had no idea what was going on. The thing about the Germans uh, was that they documented everything. And uh, Jackson's staff found a memo that Schacht had written saying that they were running low on money and they needed more gold and could they please get some more Jews so they could get some more gold teeth so that they could have some more money. And once they put that in front of him, he couldn't really argue that he didn't know what was going on anymore. Uh, Walter Funk was the Minister of, of, of Economics and he really did argue that he didn't know what was going on and, and in some ways they believed him. All right, um, I, I, this is a very important quote from Justice Jackson. As I said, Justice Jackson may not have been great in terms of, of actually like the, the give and take in the courtroom. Where he was devastating was in his opening argument. His, his opening argument, uh, it's very long. I mean, if you want to go to sleep some night, you can watch the whole thing. But he was incredibly eloquent. And, and, and Jackson's opening was, was brilliant and moving. <laughs> And, and exceptional and got people to realize how serious this was and this is just one of the quotes from his, from his opening argument. The problem was is that Justice Jackson, he, wanted, he never really understood until pretty far into the trial that Nuremberg in some ways was about the symbol, it was about the show as much as it was about getting these guys. And so he wanted to devastate them with documents. And so at the beginning of the trial especially, it was all about documentation. The problem with that is every document that was put into the record had to be read. And it then had to be translated. Now IBM had come up with this cool thing that we wouldn't think was so cool, but it, but it was pretty cool. It allowed you to push a button and you could listen simultaneously in German, English, French, Russian. Uh, so four languages it was being translated into. The problem was is that we didn't do this a lot. It wasn't like the UN now where you've got you know, hundreds of languages all at once. Interpretation machines weren't very good, so it took forever to read these documents. And all of a sudden, the prosecutors started no noticing that the journalists kind of stopped showing up, and the newsreels stopped showing film. I mean, it was Jackson up there going, I mean, and even if he put some inflection into it, it's still, you know, I've been lecturing for 55 minutes. There are people already falling asleep. Uh, you know, anytime you're in there for eight hours in a day just reading documents, imagine what that's like. And so it was just, just god awful boring. I mean, they were devastating documents. But the other prosecutors started to say to Jackson, we need some movies. We need to move people. We need witnesses. Get somebody in that chair admitting some stuff. And so Jackson finally gave in when he realized that, that the news was stopping coverage. And so the first thing they did was put up some film evidence. And they did it in, in, over the course of a single day. The first, new, the first movie they showed was called The Nazi Plan. And it was clips. You can actually see them on, I think they're up on YouTube. It's clips from German propaganda films about the planning of the war. And so you see you know, Hitler giving speeches and planning the war and all of these kinds of things. And because they were from propaganda films, they were you know, meant to sort of boost you up. And so they showed this plan, and Goering was ecstatic. Goering was like, Jackson's going to want to become a Nazi now. He really did say that. <laughs> he was like, everyone's going to see why we love the Fuhrer. They're going to see why we did what we did. And they go to lunch. And they come back in, and there's another movie. And this one's called The Nazi Concentration Camps. This one you can also see on YouTube. You better have a strong stomach if you want to watch it. And it's scenes from Dachau, and it's scenes from Bergen-Belsen. And it's scenes of burned bodies, and it's scenes of skeletal bodies. And several of the defendants actually were weeping. And journalists didn't give them much credit, and maybe I wouldn't give them much credit either. But they realized, I think, at that moment when they saw this video that they were sunk. That this video was so devastating. And Jackson finally realized, we've got to have a show here. Let's have a show. And so, um, and I don't mean that to sound like it's good. I just mean that, that you're setting a worldwide precedent here and you've got to make sure that, that if you're going to get them, it's not just going to be legal. That it's going to make sure that you really get them. And so they start putting on 
on witnesses. Or uh, Thomas Dodd, whose son Chris Dodd was a senator in, in Connecticut. Uh, Thomas Dodd uh, was reading off documents, and he's standing, he's standing at the bar and he's reading documents. And over here, or sort of over there, is a table with a sheet over the top of it. And everyone sees it, and he keeps looking at it very dramatically. He kind of had this flair for the dramatic, and no one knows what it is. And he starts talking about these documents that were signed at Bergen Belsen. And he goes, and I'll show you what his desk looked like that he was signing it on. And they pulled the sheet off. And the commandant at Bergen Belsen had taken a, a, a Jew who had been gassed, taken his skull, uh, taken his head, sorry, shrunken it by taking out the skull, had it uh, mummified in whatever way, and had it turned into a paperweight. And that was what sat on his desk as he signed the order. And, and, and uh, I heard an interview with Chris Dodd, Christopher Dodd once, and he said, you know, what my father understood was when you're throwing these numbers out there, you know, 6 million, 2 million, 100,000, you don't understand those numbers. But when you see a shrunken human head that's a paperweight, that means something. And that's what Dodd understood. And then they started putting witnesses on. And so there were witnesses like Gen General Lahas, who was second in command of German intelligence. He was the last surviving member of a group that tried to uh, kill Hitler. And he got on there and he said, this is what Goering was there for. This is what Goering was there for. Goering went here, Goering went here, Goering went here. <clears throat> uh, they brought uh, a former SS officer who worked at Auschwitz. And he talked about what we did with the Jews how many of them got killed, how many of them went into the labor. They brought out the Mauthausen death book, which was a list of everybody who had been killed. It had fake reasons why they died, but it was a list, just name after name after name of dead people. They even brought out, it, it, it's a different name and my German pronunciation sucks, but, they, it sucks, but they, the commandant of Auschwitz was also named Rudolf Haas. It's, it's Haas, but it's spelled a little differently. Um, he actually came for the defense, but he was so open about what they did at Auschwitz that uh, it was just devastating to the Germans. Uh, when they were interviewing him in the interrogations beforehand, they had a document that said, did you, did you kill one and a half million Jews in the gas chamber? And he goes, no, 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 no. We killed two and a half million. I mean, this is how precise this guy was. And it was just devastating bringing these witnesses up. So what do you do if you're the Nazis and you now have to defend yourself? Well, they went, took a few different tactics. <laughs> oh, I should have that before. Sorry, but I said <laughs> As I said, I suck. All right, so this is the defense case. They had a few different tactics. Goering was defiant to the end. When Goering took the stand, he took the stand for two days being questioned by his lawyer, the day Jackson got up to cross-examine him, everybody wanted that um, Perry Mason moment. I know I'm dating. I don't even, never saw Perry Mason. They wanted that moment, that Jack McCoy moment. Does that make more sense for you guys? Law and order kind of stuff? All right. Um, I'm not that old, but still. Uh, you know, they wanted that moment where Goering went, yeah, you're right, I did it. I killed Jews. I feel awful. Goering had wanted no part of it. And what you saw was like, it was, a, it was a boxing match between Goering and Jackson, and neither one of them could win. And Jackson wasn't, wasn't great, but Goering was, was, was. Goering was very, very sharp. So he was defiant to the end. Insanity, past claimed insanity. Sort of. Remember I told you about Hass when he flew to Scotland and he said, I forgot everything? Well, he kept it up. He said, I have amnesia. I don't remember anything. They brought Goering in. Goering said, don't you remember me, Rudolph? Da, 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 da. And Hess was like, I don't know you. They brought in his wife. I don't know you. They brought in his mistress. I don't know you. <laughs> they brought in his kids. I don't know you. And so they were like, well, let's, let's have a competency hearing for him the way we would in an American court. And so the psychiatrist is sitting down with him. He's like, I don't remember. I don't remember. I don't remember. And the psychiatrist says, all right, well, here's the thing. Um, if we declare you insane, we're taking you to a mental institution and you can't go to the trial. And Hess goes, oh, I remember. I now remember. And he remembered every, like all of a sudden because he wanted to spend time with his friends because he thought he was going to be executed, which he wasn't. Um, and he wanted to spend the last days of his life sitting next to Goering and, and Ribbentrop and all of his buddies. 
And the funny thing was, the minute he was found guilty, he said, oh, I forgot again. <laughs> and he actually, he outlived every other, uh, he was in Spandau prison until he was 93, until 1987. So he was there for 41 years he was in Spandau prison. He claimed to have amnesia for 41 years. <laughs> he was sticking to it. The weirdest thing about Hess, uh, no, I'm sorry. There are lots of weird things about Hess, a weird thing about Hess. Um, Hess killed himself at 93 after spending 41 years at Spandau Prison, which always seems strange to me, but he's a strange guy. Um, there were two Germans in particular that, that claimed to be repentant. One was Speer, who nobody really, buy, or some people buy, but most people don't. And the other one was Hans Frank, the Jew butcher of Krakow. Frank, Frank cried himself to sleep at night, had to take sleeping pills. He was a devout Catholic. He refound God. He realized what an awful human being it was. Who cares? He killed too many people. It doesn't really matter at that point. Uh, anyone who studies prisons like I do know that lots of people find God in prison and, and use that as a way to sort of excuse what they did. Um, he was repentant. I would say he was. Speer wasn't. Speer was, uh, Speer was kind of a scumbag. Uh, Speer claimed that he was repentant. He ended up, uh, in some ways, giving a lot of testimony that was helpful to the prosecution. He was only sentenced to 20 years in prison by the end of it. He only served eight. During those eight years, he wrote a 2,500-page autobiography that became a bestseller. And he ended up being a very wealthy man. Um, there was the military, uh, even though they said that you couldn't say I was just following orders, you know, Kaido and Yoda were like, we're military men, we were just following orders. It didn't help them, they were both executed, but that's what they claimed. Um, Funk and Saukal uh, claimed some form of lack of knowledge. Uh, Saukal said he was very nice to his slaves and it wasn't his fault what happened to them after they got off the trains. He really did say that. Uh, Funk said, I was just the minister of the economy. I had no idea what was going on. The real defense all of them did was blame the dead guys. <laughs> that was the defense. Blame Hitler, blame Himmler, blame Eichmann, blame Goebbels. All their fault. And for some of them, it kind of worked. As it turns out, they were relatively fair proceedings, I would argue. 11 of the defendants were sentenced to death by hanging. <coughs> There were three acquittals, uh, and the others, uh, the other eight, sorry, my math is slow, I'm tired, it's the end of the day. Uh, the other eight got various terms from 10 years to life in prison. Uh, the verdicts were handed down in October of 46. The trial took a year. Uh, their appeals were rejected 12 days later. And on the 15th, Goering commits suicide. Goering had requested that he be shot, that he get a firing squad. This was the military way to do things, that being hanged was a coward's death. And when they refused his request to go in front of a firing squad, he had befriended an American guard uh, who kind of liked him and kind of was a bit of an anti, well, no, he was an anti-Semite. Uh, it was OK, kind of, in a weird way, with what the Germans had did. And he snuck uh, Goering into the room where his luggage was. Goering had a cyanide pill there. And on October 15th, he bit into it and died. So 10 people were hanged on, on October 16th. All right, so that ends the first big trial. I swear I'm not going to spend as much time on every trial. Uh, <laughs> after that, there were, there were 12 other war crimes trials that took place between 1946 and 1949. There were actually several more planned. Uh, these trials, uh, the A team went home, the A team being Justice Jackson, the B team took over, Telford Taylor was a very good lawyer, but he was the B team, um, and, uh, and they had 12 other trials uh, for the Einstein group and for the doctors, unfortunately they didn't have Mangala, uh, the Israelis almost caught Mangala when they caught Eichmann, but they didn't quite get him, um, and, and in 1949, by 1949, some of the eagerness to continue these trials was waning, uh, especially in Germany. Germany was now split between East Germany and West Germany. Uh, the Cold War had cranked up. 
1949, um, the Russians actually blockaded West Germany. West Germany was separated from the West Berlin, sorry, was blockaded from the rest of West Germany. The Russians surrounded it, wouldn't let foodstuffs and other things in. Uh, and the Germans said, look, you know, the Russians, you know, we've had, or we as Germans, we've had enough of this. We just need your help keeping the Russians at bay. Can we please stop with all the war crime stuff? And in some ways to the Americans at this point in time, the Germans were more important to us as allies than people we were going to go after. And so in 1949, we stopped the war crimes trials run by the internationals. Um, in 52, we create a clemency board. That's how, that's how uh, Speer got out early. And most of the people who were even, you know, Hess is the only one I know of who served that long. I mean, he served for 41 years. We started letting people out of prison early. Because we needed a lot of these people for other reasons. I mean, you were taking some of the best minds in Germany and putting them behind bars, and we wanted them. We wanted their help. And so we started letting them go. And the Germans, over time, they had some trials um, in Dachau and Auschwitz, uh, or for Dachau and Auschwitz at later times. And, and the Mossad hunted Eichmann for years. Uh, so did uh, some other people. There, was a lot, there were a lot of people involved. They found him in Argentina. He was kind of living a very pathetic life by that point. He was living in a hovel of a house outside of Buenos Aires. It, it didn't have any electricity or running water. They found out he was Eichmann. They planned a whole, uh, the Argentinians were not fans of the, of the Israelis. So they planned a way to kidnap Eichmann. They threw him in the back of a car. They took him to a cabin. They got him to sign a form saying he was Eichmann. They got him to sign a form saying that he would allow himself to go to Israel. They threw him in the back of an El Al plane and they took him to Israel. <laughs> the Argentinians woke up and said, what did you guys do? And they said, we got Eichmann. They almost got, they almost got Mengele that same trip. They almost, they came very close to getting Tell them who Mengele was. Oh, they don't know, sorry. Uh, Mengele was, was the worst of the Nazi doctors. He was, he was at Auschwitz, he would decide who lived and died. He, he, he was the leader of horrible experiments on Jews, trying to figure out how to sterilize them, figure out better ways to kill them, give them diseases to see if he could cure it. Uh, that's, who, that's who he was. Um, so Eichmann was, was put on trial in Israel and executed in 1962. However, from 1949 until 1995, the international community could not come up with a way to deal with war crimes and wars of aggression. There wasn't another international criminal tribunal that was truly international for all of those years. And there are a couple reasons for that, and I'll get to that in a second. The first time we had really true international criminal tribunal after Nuremberg, what Nuremberg really led to was, was in Bosnia. In Bosnia, we had, did they study Bosnia at all here? There was, it's coming up. It's coming up? Okay, soon you're gonna learn about a big genocide in Bosnia. Um, it's coming up in your class, uh, so I won't go into it too much, but the fact is that uh, lots of Muslims were killed, there were ethnic cleansing going on. Uh, NATO went in, uh, US-led NATO forces went in, sort of saved the peace. Uh, you, the former Yugoslavia was no more the former Yugoslavia. And the international community came together and created the, the first international court of justice, actually held in Bosnia. Uh, they, they didn't finish what they were doing until 2007, actually. Um, they got convictions for several of the leaders, but very few of the henchmen. Um, I recently read a report, a report actually came out uh, last week uh, by uh, Human Rights Watch about the job the Bosnian international courts did, and they did a fairly good job. It's probably one of the success cases of international criminal justice, as much as you could say that. Um, they indicted 161 individuals. They convicted and sentenced 48 uh, to terms of up to life in prison. In some ways, uh, what Nuremberg and I would say the International Court of Justice, uh, what they were in some ways were were very important symbolically, that you were going to hold leaders uh, to account for their actions. Um, the Rwandan genocide, have they gotten there yet? No? 
right after. Okay, the Rwandan genocide uh, is in some ways a bigger tragedy than Bosnia, as you can say that about a genocide. We knew the Rwandan genocide was coming. We knew it was coming. And um, in Rwanda, the, uh, the ethnic uh, minority group killed 800,000 people in 100 days. That is the population of San Francisco and Rohnert Park combined since Christmas. Think about that. December 20th was three months ago. That's the entire population of San Francisco and Rohnert Park combined killed in 100 days. 100 days. Devastating. The problem in Rwanda is that there's the, they estimate that somewhere between 50,000 and 100,000 people took part in the killings. So you've got a big problem here. How do you put 50,000 people on trial? So on the one hand, you had the international criminal tribunals that, that held 50 trials and got 29 convictions for the leaders. But you still have neighbors living next door to each other. You know, you killed my brother. So how do you deal with it? Well, the Rwandans came up with something very interesting. They came up with something called the Kachacha Courts. I don't swear by my Rwandan pronunciation there. The Gach Is it? The Gachacha Courts. Gachacha literally means blowing grass. I don't know why that means court, but it does. Um, and basically, they're, they're open air tribunals. Uh, it's almost like a town hall meeting. And what would happen, I, I, I heard about one. I, I, I'm going to try to get the story straight if it's a little wrong. Um, it occurred before a wedding. It could happen anywhere. So there was a wedding about to take place. So the entire town came together. And this woman came forward and she pointed out a guy. You killed my brother. And then you came forward and said, no, 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 no. He didn't kill your brother. My brother killed your brother. Nice brother, huh? And then another woman came forward and said, you're right, his brother killed your brother. And so now they were going to hold a gachacha court right there before the wedding. So the whole town got together. They said, we've got two witnesses who saw you kill him. We're going to find you guilty. And now you have to serve some sentence and do some sort of restorative justice. So you're going to serve five years total. If you admit it, you're only going to serve two and a half. And half of that sentence is going to be served in prison. Half of that sentence you're going to serve doing work for the community. And it's a way to sort of get some form of reconciliation without having to have formal trials for 100,000 people. Is it a good idea? I don't know. I'm sort of a legal nerd, as I said at the beginning of this. Um, I kind of like due process. I kind of like a system that, you know, uh, allows for lawyers and things like that. Uh, has it worked in Rwanda? <coughs> maybe, maybe not. Uh, they've ended up with a lot of innocent people, probably. Um, you know, the way these courts work, are sort of like the community says, you did it, you did it, and we're going to send it to you. But it's the way they dealt with it in Rwanda. As I said 10 years ago, the International Criminal Court was, was created. Uh, actually, it was created in 1998 uh, by uh, the Rome Agreement uh, to form the International Criminal Court. 148 countries came together, made a treaty, created an international criminal court. The first question you should ask me is, why did it take over 50 years to get there? It's because, to this day even, they have not agreed on a definition of what an aggressive war is. How do you define an aggressive war? They still can't decide. Uh, there are, of uh, the 148 countries that came together and created the International Criminal Courts, 114 of those states became members. Can you guess what country is not a member of the International Criminal Court? The United States. The United States. China also is not a member. Russia is also not a member. So these are the three most powerful countries in the world. None of them are members, so they're not supporting it financially and they're not members of it. You know why we're not a member of it? We might need to do an aggressive war. What's that? We might need to commit an aggressive war. We might have committed an aggressive war. Yes. Did Iraq attack us? 
No. Okay? I'm not, I, I, I can criticize any, it, it, you could argue, I'm not saying you're right, I'm not saying you're wrong. You could argue that Iraq was an aggressive war. Iraq never bombed us. Now, we may have said we had the right to do it, but couldn't one argue that this was an aggressive war? Do we want our president going on trial for this? Yes. No. <laughs> You're crazy if you say yes. You're crazy if you say yes. Imagine what damage that does to us in the international community. Imagine. Do I think we should be a part of the court? Yeah, we should. But we don't want, our, we don't want George W. Bush on trial there. Obama doesn't want George. He may hate George W. Bush. I don't know if he hates him. You may hate George W. Bush. But the argument is that it weakens us as a country. The other thing is we don't want our soldiers going on trial there. We don't want that. And this is the biggest problem with the International Criminal Court, is that if you're going to have it, everybody's got to take part. So the International Criminal Court was created in 2002. There have been seven official investigations in the last year. Kenya, Congo, Sudan, Central African Republic, Uganda, Libya, and the Ivory Coast. What do all of those countries have in common? They're all in Africa. They're all in Africa. And one of the big critiques of the International Criminal Court is it's However you want to look at it. It's the first world telling the third world what to do, or it's the white people telling the brown people what to do. Either way you look at it, it's a pretty decent critique. And the reason why this is, 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 is twofold. Well, besides any, any other reason you want to come up with. But I, I will argue it's twofold. One is that in order to come before the International Criminal Court, you have to be a member nation. Or you have to be recommended by the UN Security Council. The only time that's happened is Libya. Syria probably, Syria might end up being the first non-African country brought before the court. So, um, you're not gonna get a lot of these first world countries that are not members of the International Criminal Court to, have to go in front of them. Because they're not member nations. So they've had seven official investigations. They've made 28 indictments. They had their first conviction, two weeks ago was it? I think it was two weeks ago, three weeks ago. First conviction, one of the Congolese warlords. One of the Congolese warlords who had child, child soldiers ended up being convicted. They've also had one acquittal. That's it. Sorry about the door, that was my friend. All right, so that's the International Criminal Court. All right, so to wrap up. I went, I went long. Um, sorry about that, I hope it was at least interesting. Uh, so to wrap up a little bit. Some of the uh, continuing issues we have. First off, I'd like to say, you know, what I think the lessons of Nuremberg were, and you can disagree with me if you wish. I think the two big lessons of Nuremberg were, one, the importance of symbolism, and two, the importance of having proper expectations. Nuremberg has become a symbol of what you should do during a horrific it has become that symbol. It has become a symbol of what you can do when the entire international community actually comes together and supports those efforts. Uh, a guy named Gary Bass, who wrote a book called uh, Stay the Hand of Vengeance, uh, uses a baseball analogy. So if you're not a baseball fan, I apologize, but I'm a Red Sox fan, so I'm going to use it anyway. What he says is, if, if Jackson and the Nuremberg team were a Major League Baseball team, the International Criminal Court team, although very good human rights lawyers, are like a pretty decent small town softball team. That's the difference. It's not the difference between the major leagues and AAA. And this isn't anything about their, they, they're, they're very good lawyers. They don't have the support of the whole world the way that they're So as a symbol of what the world can do when it comes together, I think Nuremberg serves that purpose. The second thing is, is that we need to change our expectations of what these courts can do. This isn't like a crime. This isn't like, you know, I steal your purse and I go to jail for whatever period of time. It's just different. It's just different. So our expectations of what we're going to get out of these things, whether we're going to get some semblance of reconciliation, we need to sort of change our expectations. Um, the continuing issue, as I mentioned, the lack of worldwide support for the ICC. 
I still don't think we know what the point of these criminal courts, these international criminal courts are. are. Are we trying to deter other world leaders from committing genocide? If we are, we're doing a pretty lousy job. The criminal justice system does a lousy job of deterrence generally, and these courts are no different. Anyone who thinks the death penalty deters anyone from murdering anyone needs to look at some studies. Because the studies show it ain't happening. We do not do a good job of deterring crime. If they're vengeance, then they're vengeance. And that's OK. If they're reconciliation, then maybe there's something different that we need to do. Maybe the Rwandan model works. If what we're looking for is reconciliation, give somebody a feeling that at least something was done. I also think that the continuing issue is our fault, which is that we as liberal nations, and I don't mean that left-wing liberal, I mean classical liberal nations, we have a very uncomfortable relationship we, we don't understand the uncomfortable relationship between law, justice, and morality. I, I've said to my students a few times, whether they remember it or not, that the Supreme Court is a court of law, not a court of justice. It's not there to make just rulings. It's there to make legal determinations. And law and just are not always the same thing. Legal and just are not always the same thing. Just and moral are not always the same. If you get a legal ruling that happens to be just and happens to be moral, in hockey they call that a hat trick. That's three different sports references today. Um, you know, you're doing great. But the best you can hope for from these courts is that they're going to at least make legal decisions. And you hope they're maybe just. You hope that they're going to be moral. And we really need to just live up to the fact that that's the best we can do. So thank you very much for your my students know I, I, I get sick of talking after a while that's why I ask a lot of questions so that's about the longest I think I've ever spoken straight in my life so <laughs> I hope you have some questions because I always like answering questions yes um, I read that Bush was actually indicted for crimes the Malaysian war tribunal I heard that too um, <laughs> it, she heard that Bush was actually indicted in a Malaysian war crimes tribunal I'd have to check that um, I remember reading something about that, too. Um, it obviously didn't go anywhere. Uh, it was not the ICC that, that indicted Bush. There were people who argued for it. The ICC can't indict Bush because we're not a member nation. So the only way that they could indict Bush is if the UN Security Council actually recommended indicting him. And do you know who's not going to do that? <laughs> Us. Um, and I don't think anyone else is. I just don't, I don't see that. Has Rumsfeld been uh, like changing no. I, I mean, maybe by something like the Malaysian, you know, the, you know, but not that I've seen. Yes? How did they almost get that doctor? How did they almost get Mengele? There's a great book called uh, The Hunt for Eichmann, and I'm blanking on who wrote it. It really reads like a, you know, exciting detective novel, except it's true. Um, in, the Mossad agents were actually... Um, I want to get the story right. Uh, one of the Mossad agents was actually there um, staking out Mengele. And, and Mengele, he did, he, 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 the Mossad agent ended up calling back to Israel to get approval to get a team over there to grab Mengele. In the meantime, uh, Mengele kind of caught wind that somebody was asking strange questions about him. He ended up changing his identity again, moving to a new town. Mengele had a lot of money after the war, and the Israelis never caught wind of him again. Um, while he was there, he also started to get rumors about Eichmann and where he was. And, and that, was, that was how, there was, it was very confusing. There were people who knew where Eichmann was and were telling the West German government where Eichmann was, and the information wasn't getting to the Israelis, and eventually it did. And so uh, they were like, well, while we're here, we'll get Eichmann. It's a much more interesting story than I just made it sound, so you should read the book, it's great. <laughs> um, can you elaborate a little bit on the connection between prison systems and the Holocaust? Why I yeah. make that connection? Oh, yes. goodness. Um, just a little brief elaboration. Never brief. 
Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I guess because, I, you know, I, I was a weird kid anyway and a nerdy kid. And so, I, you know, there was a part of me, I, I think my mother was always upset because I would read these Holocaust stories and then I wouldn't sleep because I'd be waiting for the stormtroopers to come down my hallway in Bangor, Maine. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, but I remember, what I remember distinctly um, was the picture I always had in my head at the barracks in Auschwitz that I got from that. I still, you know, I've seen pictures of it, so I, maybe that's where the picture comes from. But I remember thinking, what is it like to live like that, that repressed? Not even so much the, the dying side, they're trying to live day by day, you know, four people to a wooden bunk and try to survive. Um, and I remember as a kid um, uh, in Maine, what used to be the Maine State Prison is, is in a beautiful area uh, of Thomason. And I remember driving by the walls of it and, and making that connection between the two. And, and then uh, when I was in high school, a friend of mine actually went to the Maine State Prison and I visited him. Um, and became more fascinated by prisons, and, and it just became something of a, a bit of an obsession. I never thought I would study prisons. I mean, that didn't really, I went to, I went to graduate school, I, my degrees in political science, not criminal justice, I was gonna study law. And I specifically wanted to study the death penalty, and, and uh, I, but I was always interested in prisons, and I had a faculty member who sort of said, you should move in that direction. And when it's your advisor, you kind of go, okay, I'm moving that direction, and that's how I got interested in prisons. But, but I really do trace it back to thinking about what the barracks were like now. Weird story, I guess. <laughs> I think, I think in some ways, um, it, well, the African Union, it, the African Union became a part of it, and, and so if you were a member nation in the African Union, you had to sign on. And the same thing happened with the European Union. So all of European Union member nations are a part of the International Criminal Court. So I think there were countries in Africa that did it very unwillingly. Um, and, and so a member nation essentially, uh, you know, after, you know, after something horrific happens, ends up filing a request for an investigation with the prosecutors in the International Criminal Court, and then the International Criminal Court is allowed to go and investigate. What the International Criminal Court is not allowed to do is they don't have their own police force to go and get the people. So one of the reasons why they haven't actually had as many trials as they would have liked to is that, that they have warrants out for, you know, people in Stan who they don't have physically in their custody. Um, and it was difficult in, in, in Bosnia, too, because NATO, NATO said, you know, even if we trip over somebody who's an indicted war criminal, we're not arresting them. That's not part of our mission. We're here to keep the peace, and that might not keep the peace. So um, you really have to wait until the member nation ends up changing hands of governments and they turn over their war criminals. And that's how it usually happens. I want to point out to you that uh, a rather infamous war criminal died this week in a nursing home in southern Germany. He was uh, Lithuanian, I believe, or um, Lithuanian, or he was one of he the was people that was recruited to work at the death camps by the Germans. You remember that they had people that they worked alongside, who worked alongside the SS. His name was John de Manier, and came to the United States, became an American citizen, but they found out that he had lied about his wartime service and was tried and deported. And uh, it was a very, very famous case. He was actually tried twice. Twice? Because they thought he was somebody else. Right. They thought he was this guy named Ivan the Terrible, and it turns out he wasn't Ivan the Terrible, but he was still quite terrible. <laughs> 
Uh, and so he was, he was, they found out he wasn't who they thought he was the first time, and then he was tried again. But there's still, I would say, several thousand of those kind of people that are still um, living. He died in 93, and it doesn't look as though um, some of the workers, the people who hunt war criminals, are going to let them off the hook. So they still have to look over their shoulders. Will you join me?